How to play the guitar, finger picking or finger style. Lesson three. This is the second tune in the finger picking course. And again, we'll be using the Pimmy finger picking pattern. However, this will be the last time for a while as we're introducing a new finger in the next lesson, the annular finger. This tune is called Autumn Rain by Sad Fantasy and we'll hear it first just so you've got an idea of what it goes like. Because of the length and complexity of this particular tune, you're almost definitely going to need to be able to see the ebook of it. You'll find it at ebooksforguitar.com, the links below in the description, and you're looking for month 9, week 2. To make this tune easier to learn, we're going to break it down into three sections, a beginning, a middle and the end. However, really, once you've got the beginning, you've also got the end, because there's very little difference in the chords. Before we get started looking at the tune, let's just have a quick look at a symbol that we'll be using in the tune, which you may not have seen before. This symbol is a fermata, and basically it means pause. So, whatever note or rest it's over lasts a little longer than it should do. The strange thing about this is that it isn't a fixed period. So you can't really practice it with a metronome as it won't fit from beat to beat. In this particular piece, I'd suggest that the pause should be the equivalent of taking a breath. Now, if you choose to take a breath quickly or slowly, that's entirely up to you. It's down to your own interpretation of the tune. And that's partially what we'll be learning in this tune. It's not only the finger picking pattern, which we already know, but we're introducing this idea of interpreting the music in order to make it work better for yourself. So we'll look at this as we go through the tune. Right, let's learn to play the first section of Autumn Rain. In this section, there's four chords, or really, you could even interpret it as two chords where we just add and remove fingers in order to enhance the chords. Before attempting to finger pick these chords, let's just strum them. First, strum a C major. Then add the fourth finger to the third fret of the B string. 
and this creates the C add 9. Notice it isn't necessary to remove the first finger. You can if you want, but I actually think this will slow you down because the next chord you want to go to is an A minor. And if you play the A minor to the C, you'll notice the first finger doesn't move. So I'd actually recommend keeping it in place. So let's see that again. C major, then we add the fourth finger to create a C add nine. Now we can go on to the next stage by taking off the fourth finger and moving the third finger across to create an A minor. And then by removing the first finger, we have the final chord, which is A minor add nine. So that's all four chords. Let's see that again a little more quickly. C major, C add nine, A minor, a minor add 9. That's the first four chords. Practice them for a moment so you can get used to them. Here they are as well with a metronome beat. Initially we'll do them twice one chord every two bars, in other words every eight beats, and then we'll do them one chord every four beats or one bar. Once you feel fairly happy with those four chords and the chord changes, we can try adding the finger picking pattern now. This theoretically should be fairly easy, as it's exactly the same finger picking pattern we used in lesson two. That is primary, index, middle, index. And we're using the same strings as well. So A, G, B, G. And we stick with this finger picking pattern for the moment for the four chords. So let's see that done slowly. If we look now at the second line of the tune, you'll notice it's identical to the first line of the tune, except for the last bar, where we finish on the A string with the primary finger. Let's hear the second line done slowly. Practice what we've looked at so far and try and bring the first and second lines together to form the first part of the tune. Here it is slowly. Right, let's have a look now at the second part of the tune, or the middle section. 
This section is a lot longer and more involved than the first part, and indeed the last part. You'll notice most of the chords we've already covered, except for one, and that's the E7. And this is a different E7 than the ones we've got in the chord charts. As we've just been doing with the C add 9, we're adding the fourth finger to the B string to create the E7. So let's try that now. Now try just going between the E and the E7 just to get used to that movement of the little finger. Right, let's have a look at the first line of the second section, going between the E major and the A minor. Straight away you'll notice that the chord shape is very similar, it's just on different strings. So if you can, you can maintain that shape just moving it up and down the strings, this increases your speed. But beware of the finger picking, you'll notice the E major we used the bottom E string as the bass note played with the primary and with the A minor we play the A string with the primary. So as we change between these two chords the primary finger must go between the bottom E string and the A string and back again. Try that now and see how you get on. Once you feel fairly comfortable with the first line of section 2, we can go on to the second line. Straight away you'll notice, basically, it's just the E major to the A minor again. However this time, by adding and removing fingers, we're changing the chords and adding a slight variation to the melody to make the tune more interesting. Most of the changes in this line we've done in previous exercises. We've already done the E major to the E 7th change and we've done the A minor to the A minor add 9 change. However, we've never done the change between the E 7 and the A minor or the A minor add 9 to the E major. The easiest way to learn this line then is actually to deal with it all in one go and try to learn the line. So let's hear it played nice and slowly so you can see and hear how it's done. And then try it yourself and slowly build up the speed and the fluency until you're happy with it. Once you're reasonably confident you can play lines 1 and 2 of the second section, the middle section, try bringing them together into one smooth flowing piece. Obviously you need to start nice and slowly but then as you can speed up. But remember the most important thing is the flow and in order to get this you have to concentrate on trying to build the speed of the chord changes and the fluency of the chord changes.
Let's see that again, showing both hands. Okay, let's look at the last two lines of the second section, the middle section. And you'll notice straight away, both these lines contain the same chords, they're just in a slightly different order. The first line is D major, A minor, D major, E major. The second line is D major, A minor, E major, A minor. So really, what you're concentrating on in these two lines is simple chord changes. However, beware with the finger picking. Remember that the primary finger always plucks the root of the chord. So, for a D chord, you play the D string. For an A chord, you play the A string. And for an E chord, you play the E string. And with these, it doesn't matter if it's major, minor, seventh or whatever it will always be the E, A, D, respectively. Right, let's hear the first line of this section played nice and slowly. You want to practice this until you feel reasonably happy with it and then we'll try the second line of this section. So let's hear that played nice and slowly. Once you've played both lines of this section, with them being the same chords in different orders, we can bring them together quite quickly. So let's hear those two lines brought together nice and slowly. Let's see that again, showing both hands. quite important for me to mention at this point during the tutorial that you've already covered quite a lot of chords and chord changes. So don't feel you have to learn it all in one run of this video. You might find you need to stop the video in certain points and go away and practice parts and come back again. If that's the case, don't worry, that's quite normal. So don't panic and don't try to learn the tune all in one big long run. Take your time over learning this tune and you'll do a far better job of learning it that way anyway. Right, we need to have a special look at this last bar in the second section of the tune. You'll notice two things there that stand out. One is this new symbol, the pause symbol, 
that I briefly mentioned at the beginning of the video, and the second is the double lines and the double dot at the end of the stave. Firstly, let's have a look at the fermata symbol, and this symbol literally means pause. I always say, especially in a tune like this, the easiest way to gauge the sort of length of pause you should be taking is just to take a breath. However, how long you take to take that breath is entirely up to you. And this is one of the strange things about the pause symbol. It's down to the interpretation of the musician how long it should be. Obviously there's limitations and obviously if you pause it too long you'll actually ruin the tune rather than adding to it. So here's an example of how I treat this going from here back to the beginning. So I'm going to play the last line of this section and then the first line of the beginning. Let's hear that again. I'm sure you will have worked out by now that it's not really possible to use a metronome where you're doing things like pausing. Obviously you'd have to try and pause the metronome and this would be quite impractical. So this kind of tune doesn't really work with a metronome. Where I've used a metronome in this video it's just to help you guys try and play over me and it, I find it helps you to learn the tune. However when you've got the whole tune from start to finish you want to try playing it without a metronome. We'll look into this in more detail once we've gone through the entire tune. The other symbol in this bar is a repeat symbol. You'll see it there at the end with a double line and a double dot. You treat a repeat very much like you treat brackets where there's always a second repeat somewhere. So if you look back to the very beginning of the piece you can see there's a repeat mark facing the other way. What this means is you repeat everything between these two marks. So basically, when you are playing this tune, you play from the beginning down to this point, pause, and then go back to the beginning and play the entire thing again. However, the second time you'd pass straight through the repeat symbol and play the last bit of the tune. It can be a little confusing for repeat marks when you first use them. So if you look down below in the description, I've put a link to a previous video I've done on how to understand repeats. And that tutorial goes into a lot more detail about repeats. Right, let's have a look at the very last section of the tune. And looking at this straight away, you can see it's actually quite easy because all you're actually playing is the first section of the tune one and a half times and then just repeating a chord change between the A minor and the A minor add 9 over and over again. Let's hear this last section played.
let's hear the entire tune played once again, however this time with a metronome beat in double time. This is more accurate as the tune is based in quavers, in other words each note you play is half a beat. So we'll hear that now and I will be talking over the top of it to tell you where you are, just to make sure you've understood the arrangement. Start with section 1. Section 2. right back to the beginning, so this is section 1 again. And this is obviously section 2 again. straight through to section 3. Right, let's hear that again, but without me saying anything.
Right, I'm just going to do a brief explanation of something a little unusual and something I don't think is taught enough in guitar lessons, especially online ones. When playing a tune like this, which is free time or open time, where you can change the speed and pause and use your own interpretation, I think there's a lot of scoping there to improve the way you sound. For example, you can speed up and slow down the tune to create an emotional response. However, you can also use this to your favour if, for example, you have a particular chord change you struggle with. So if I had a real struggle with a chord change, for example, a D, I could slow the tune down towards the D and then speed it up again once I passed the D. Obviously, this doesn't work in all music, only in this sort of open time tune. However, there is another point about this as well, and that is that it improves the way you sound. The whole point of music is to create an emotional response. And because of this, when you're playing a musical instrument, it's just as important that you have the ability to act as well as play the instrument, because you have to create the feeling with the instrument. If you look around on YouTube, or if you go into a guitar shop and listen to people coming and trying guitars, it's amazing how many times you'll hear people play a tune, but if you actually listen to it, there's just something wrong and something missing. And nine out of 10 times, this is what it is. It's easy to learn to play something technically. It's far more difficult to learn to play it and express it as a piece of music. And this is really important if you want to be a good guitarist. And also, if you want to stand out as a guitarist. So, with this tune, it's worth you playing around, slowing down, speeding it up, playing the instrument more quietly or more loudly to try and create this emotional response. At the end of the day, there are actually symbols for expression that I could have put over the tab and taught you how to read. However, this wouldn't have done you any real good because you want to learn to express things yourself and learn to put expression into the music without having to follow specific instructions. Right, just so you can understand what I've been talking about, I'll do some examples now in order to give you a good idea. You can copy these initially and then try to develop your own ideas in time. Cause one day, hopefully, you'll be writing music yourself and you want your music to impress people who listen to it. And this is one of the ways of doing that. If you keep following this online course, we will eventually cover all the symbols for the different kinds of expression, so you can read it off the page or write it if you have to. Here's the tune again, but without a metronome and with me putting in some emotions, I'll be using just speed and volume at the moment. However, see if you can hear what I'm doing and see if you can replicate it for yourself.
If you've enjoyed this lesson and want to see more like it, please like and subscribe so you'll be notified when new lessons are published. Remember that the ebook for this lesson is available at ebooksforguitar.com and it's month 9, week 2. And thank you for watching.